Hello and welcome. I am Dr. Pamela Hurst Della Pieta, President and Founder of Children and Screens, Institute of Digital Media and Child Development, and host of the popular Ask the Experts webinar series. We're delighted that you and 600 others have registered to discuss the digital divide and how we can all work together to establish and maintain digital equity. Whether or not you're worried about particular children and families with limited access and require practical solutions, want to be involved in implementing solutions for social change in your community or anywhere in between, our experts have some excellent advice in store for you. The homework gap and, in, and inequity in broadband access have been concerns in our community for many years, but with strong advocacy, thoughtful interventions and new legislation, the story is beginning to change. In fact, the inclusion of $17.2 billion for closing the homework gap in the recently passed American Rescue Plan is a watershed moment for digital equity, but there's a lot of more work to be done. Stay tuned for a lively discussion about what we know, how we're addressing the concerns and what steps are required. The group we have convened have reviewed the questions you submitted. They will answer as many as possible during and after their presentations. If you have additional questions during the workshop, please type them into the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. When you do, please indicate whether or not you'd like to ask your question live on camera if time permits, or if you prefer the moderator to uh, ask your question. We're recording today's workshop and we'll upload a video onto YouTube in the coming days. All registrants will receive a link to our YouTube channel where you'll find videos from our past 28 webinars, which we hope you will watch and as you wait for this video to be posted. It's now my great pleasure to introduce our moderator. Lee Rainey is the Director of Internet and Technology Research at Pew Research Center, where his team has issued more than 650 reports based on surveys which examine people's online activities and the internet's role in all of our lives. We're delighted that he is here to share his expertise and experience with us today. Welcome, Lee. Thanks so much, Pam. Um, I'm delighted to be here. It's a, it's a real honor. It's kind of a bucket list moment for me. I've watched the growth of the children and screens community that you and your colleagues have built and it's sort of an amazing thing to behold and uh, and it's a, an important uh, voice now in a, in a particularly intense moment as we uh, are going through the pandemic and its aftermath. We had a little debate amongst ourselves as we were preparing for this about what the Oxford English Dictionary word of the year for 2020 should have been. And um, one of the panelists, Beth Holland, uh, summed it up beautifully by calling it the dumpster fire year. It's brought um, more urgent questions to the forefront about what schools should be doing, how society should be serving all of uh, its children, uh, what is the right role of screens and screen-based activities and learning in people's lives. And uh, there are now, of course, sort of new urgencies to these questions as so much activity is now uh, taking place online. So I thought I would go through a, a high level overview of some of the most um, uh, interesting and relevant Pew data uh, from, from this season. And I'm just about to load my slides here before we got to the other panelists' the discussions. Uh, this is the core material that we uh, developed at the, at the very beginning of the pandemic. So a, a year ago, April, we asked about the stressors that would be occurring in all kinds of families. We asked uh, um, parents with children whose uh, children were uh, sent home from school and were, were getting remote learning during, during April uh, 2020. We asked about particular things related to uh, digital divides, particularly as remote work was, was now taking place so much online. So we asked, how, do you, what is the likelihood that your ch child is gonna have to do work on a cell phone rather than on a wired computer. Uh, as you can see there, low 43% of, of uh, low income families said that was very likely uh, or somewhat likely to be happening in the coming year. And then subsequent data we've gathered on this thing shows that that number actually was, was uh, lower than, than it turned out to be the case. We also asked what is the likelihood uh, that your child will have to use public Wi-Fi to finish their schoolwork because there's not a reliable internet connection at home. Again, 40% of lower income 
children compared with 22% of the full population. So one in five kids were gonna have this struggle anyway, and it was double that for low income families. So again, it, it means that they de can't depend on what's available in their household and they have to go somewhere else or find another route to get access to the kind of uh, remote learning that they were getting. And we asked, uh, what is the likelihood that your child will not be able to complete their schoolwork because they do not have access to a computer at home? And more than a third of low income families reported that, 21%, so one in five children of these children uh, were gonna experience that across the board, across the economic spectrum. The number that's circled down there in the lower right-hand side is if you said yes to any one of these three things, uh, that's, that's sort of an additive number. So some people reported that all three things were gonna happen, happen to them. But if you said, uh, yes, this was a likely thing to happen, uh, you got counted in this. And it was six in 10 lower income uh, families were, were anticipating experiencing these kinds of problems with school. And it just added to the uh, you know, the stress and, and the confusion that greeted so much of the activity during the end of the school year in the, the spring semester of 2020, and then the, the fall semester of, of the next school year that began in the second half of the year 2020. Um, at, in the, at the beginning of 2021, we asked about the previous year's experience here, and you can see that lower income children were more likely than upper income children to have received only online instruction uh, at their schools. And so you know, more than half uh, were reporting that. And again, sort of in circumstances where that already was a, a potential problem, that was already a relatively hard thing to do. You can just imagine, and I, I know our panelists are gonna be discussing what, what, how that played out in individual families, but it was just you know, so hard to see. And, they, and, and those families were just under incredible amounts of, of pressure. Um, there we captured, again, sort of looking backwards at the lost year or the lost time that uh, children were in school, uh, lower income families were more likely than other families to say that the loss of that school time was a big concern that their children were going to fall behind at school, that they weren't getting uh, the kind of access to their teachers, access to educational materials, access to materials that they needed to complete their assignments. And so, you know, this is a big concern across cultures that ground will be lost, but it's particularly acutely felt by lower income families. And it's particularly felt uh, by, by families that, um, you know, were getting remote edu education as part of the uh, suite of services they were getting from their schools. Um, we also uh, picked up on things uh, even before the pandemic that have played out in the pandemic. So a big, uh, concern in the uh, children in screens community and a lot of the programming that you have done ar around these issues relates to the stuff that is happening online. So there's one level of problem that I've just talked about where lack of access is its own struggle and its own problem, but the stuff that's happening online is also of deep concern to parents and educators. In this particular um, battery of questions, we ask parents uh, about children using YouTube and 80% of parents of minor children said that their child was a, a user of YouTube, at least in some way, and about half of them used YouTube on a daily basis. Uh, then we asked um, uh, about you know, th this activity by, by different groups, and you can see that, that Black uh, families and Hispanic families were more likely to report that their children were heavy YouTube users getting on daily or a little bit more often than that. And those families, not surprisingly, were also highly concerned about the kind of content um, and the kind of people that they would be meeting as they were uh, in, the, in the YouTube environment. They were, they, they were very likely to report, uh, worry about encountering inappropriate content. They were strikingly worried about the things that uh, were gonna be advertised for them uh, and the data that were collected uh, maybe around some of that advertising. So the kind of uh, functioning of the algorithms of those systems. Um, and therefore, they were worried about the, the videos that were recommended to their children because it was, a, a, it was an algorithmic process that was um, a, you know, not in their control. And parents are always um, concerned about those kinds of things as, uh, as, as, a, as they play out. So that's a very broad overview. I'm happy to answer more questions later on about the particulars of, of Pew uh, research. But uh, now it's, it's my pleasure to um, begin the introductions of the uh, panel members. 
Uh, first, we're going to start with Angela Seifer, who's the executive director of the National Digital Inclusion Alliance, uh, from physically setting up computer labs in underserved areas and managing local digital inclusion programs to consulting with the US Department of Commerce and testifying before Congress. Angela develops the national strategies and solutions from the ground up. And that's what she's going to talk about now. Over to you, Angela. Thanks, Lee. It's fabulous to join you all. Uh, it's great to be here with Lee, who uh, you all know, we use Pew Data for this work constantly. So that's awesome. As Lee noted, the digital divide is about the access to the devices, the access to the internet, and the digital skills. So it's really, it's all of those things. When I started this work 20 some years ago, we called it the digital divide. Our solutions we talked about in terms of community technology. And we often talked about it in terms of having access to a computer. Internet was kind of a bonus, right? It wasn't expected you would have internet in your home 20 years ago. Today, you better have internet in your home, right? <laughs> like trying to get by today without that was, is life's really hard, right? We, that all became really clear during the pandemic. So the way we talk about it now is that the digital divide is not having access to any of those digital tools that we need to survive today. But for those of us who are in the field working on it, we talk about it in terms of digital equity and digital inclusion. So digital, and these definitions, these are things that NDIA came up with when we got started about seven years ago because there wasn't a clear definition. So digital equity is the goal. This is communities and individuals having full access to information communication technology to do whatever it is they need to do. Digital inclusion then is the how. These are the activities that would get us to that digital equity. So this is affordable home broadband, uh, the right device for your task, digital literacy skills training, digital navigation support, right? Tech support, the things that would help us to be able to fully participate. Uh, in our current environment, uh, often the term digital divide is used to refer to infrastructure availability. Does someone have that infrastructure available so that they can subscribe to it? But the pandemic helped show that that's only one barrier. A, a much bigger barrier is actually that folks can't afford it. And as Lee was explaining in his, uh, going over his data, poverty is a consistent factor in all of this, which gets us to that lack of affordability of broadband at that at a low income level. But then it's also the digital skills. So this is one that's harder to kind of pinpoint. And it's one that I we at NDIA think had not enough attention has been placed on that there are some school districts where they're like, okay, here's a hotspot, get to it. And then the parents are, you know, just kind of standing there with a hotspot. They're like, I, 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 what did you just what did you just give me? Because we don't do this in our household, right? Like I'm scared for my child's safety or um, I'm worried about my own privacy, uh, right? There's all kinds of reasons why someone would not trust the internet. You all know that really well. Uh, but then there's that whole, how do you safely participate online? And if you don't have support systems for do that, you're just not gonna do it, right? Uh, so my role today is to go over kind of those pieces with you and we'll dig in some more in a bit. Back to you, Lee. Thanks so much. I mean, it's really, it's such an important contribution you've made to the conversation by noting that access is the first stage of, of digital divides and so many other things are now a part of the concerns that people have about it. And one of the ones that we've picked up uh, in our work most recently is that the people's personal social networks are under stress. And to the degree that they are turning to smarter, more tech savvy people in their universe, it's just harder to do now when people are um, under the kinds of pressures that they are just to get through uh, the day-to-day -day stuff. So, so thank you for your, your expansion of, of those considerations. And it's a, it is a tricky thing to measure, but it's been a really important thing to understand. Uh, it's now my pleasure to introduce uh, Dr. Nicole Howard, who is an assistant professor of STEM education in the School of Education's Department of Teaching and Learning at the University of Redlands. She is also the co-director of the Race Education Analytics Learning Lab, the real lab in the Center for Educational Justice and a, and a real sort of giant in this field. And it's my pleasure to turn it over to you, Nicole. Thank you, Lee, for that introduction. And um, what a perfect setup. I hope you all can see my screen okay. Sometimes our um, 
systems do something different, but that's technology. So I want to talk um, today with you all about some of the challenges related to um, some of the things that Angela and Lee have already set up for us. There are these issues related to device access and Wi-Fi connectivity that do persist for our students today at home and at school. And even though there are some major concerns and other concerns related to how we've responded to the COVID-19 pandemic, we will talk today and I will speak uh, specifically today on some of those um, digital inequities. I'd like to take us, um, uh, as I mentioned earlier, or just a moment ago, take us specifically to how I'm talking about digital divide and digital equity. Um, digital divide is uh, devi defined more specifically as this social disparity related to access or the frequency of use and the ability to use technology to innovate. Um, and when I speak about digital equity, I'm speaking about equitable access to the advanced technologies um, and the subsequent afforded learning experiences, regardless of race, regardless of disability, socioeconomic status, language, geography, gender, um, and other historically related inequities. And so amid the learning um, shift and in all the changes that happened as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic, there were some challenges. And so I wanted to specifically hear from a student about because I've done research and asked teachers and educators about their stories. And so I wanted to hear from a student about their challenges. So let's hear uh, for a moment from Kamal what his challenges were. Um, the first challenge was getting used to a new platform. Uh, the second challenge was adjusting uh, to attending Zoom and learning new classmates. And so you, you heard just then that um, um, the challenge, um, the, first challenge was the challenge was related to adjusting to the new platform, right? So for um, this is a positive story, obviously, because Kamau had access to Wi-Fi and had access to connectivity um, at home. And even though the district was not initially one to one, they did move fairly quickly to make sure that there were devices and hotspots in hand. So he was able to access the learning and then connect with um, with other classmates. And so in this next video, I ask Kamau, what were the silver linings? Like what were some of the positives? And so let's hear. Uh, the good things about it are, I can easily contact the teacher if I have any problems with the platform that I use uh, through email, uh, or I can come to a second Zoom and also tell her there so we can review it and make sure that the problem is fixed. And so Kamau had uh, what he described as access, direct access, not just to the technology, but to his teachers as well. And what Kamau shared later on is that his use of YouTube actually helped him progress from a fifth grade level in mathematics to a seventh grade level because some of the instructions that were embedded in the virtual learning platform were not um, giving him exactly what he needed. So having access to YouTube gave him an opportunity to even go a bit further in his mathematics. And so these stories are of course great stories um, and there are many great stories that are can be shared about how students are learning and students from different backgrounds. But I also do want to talk for a minute about the fact that there are still some some challenges, even with the glimmers of hope that we've seen. Um, Kamal was very fortunate, again, to be in a district that knew how to respond in a flurry uh, to the COVID-19 uh, pandemic. But we, as Angela described, have different ways in which we're looking at the digital divide. We have um, what I call that uh, level one, the traditional level one term that we've used, but we have the issue of access. And if we look at the student in the very first box and think about what her story is, that story is no device at school, a shared cell phone um, at home, limited Wi-Fi connectivity, technology used occasionally for learning through school, and then maybe lessons um, or not having the innovative lessons or opportunities to innovate. And then we have the next student who has access at school, um, has learning opportunities at school and at home, but is not necessarily being pushed to explore and innovate. So these are still concerns, right? That our students have access to the technology, um, but right now we're focusing on learning, learning loss. Um, I'd like to say we should be thinking about the learning gains and we should be thinking about the other opportunities that I would even imagine for this next student and that um, 
this particular student would have access to teachers who are talking about the current systems when we talk about oppression and these oppressive ideologies and assumptions that we're confronted with. And I mean, we can talk later about why it is that our Black and Latino, Latina, Latinx students are vastly underrepresented in Silicon Valley. Um, these are things for us that are getting at that next level. It's that we might have young black girls in Black Girls Code and they're doing uh, great work and learning great new technologies and how to use them for learning and they're exploring, but we still need to address the fact that we have underrepresentation in the fields later on. Uh, so again, um, what's happening at home, um, parents and families are, we're, we're, they're figuring it out. They're figuring out the fact that, you know, the learning has to continue, yes, but sometimes there are moments for us to step away from the learning and to use our technologies in different ways. And uh, researchers have studied the digital divide, as Angela has mentioned, for decades. Um, however, there are some actions that still need to be taken to address the impacts of digital inequities, the lack of effective support systems for families, now that we understand the relationship between specific contexts such as racial and gender disparities within the districts and communities. We need to also um, offer educators more opportunities to cultivate curiosity and encourage exploration for their students in order to be able to reach home and encourage the same in families at home. Um, basically what I'm saying is how do, how do we support families in leveraging the technology that they do have access to and how do we take those stories that we hear about our rural school districts that do not have the same access and connection activity, how are we taking those stories and uh, offering the counter narrative and talking about the ways in which those districts have are, are engaging in powerful family engagement practices and how they are still going to homes and figuring out ways to connect with parents. So um, definitely more to talk about. And I'd say most importantly, we need to continue to hear from our key stakeholders, such as students like Kamau and his family. We need a opening, opening up the academic year for 2021 and 2022 with conversations with families and students and hearing from them about the learning that has been happening at home. Hey, Nicole, it was wonderful that you got Kamal to address one of the questions that had come into us um, about the silver linings. And it, it, he was so beautifully articulate about that. And, and in a world where so many people are now going to move to tell everything, you know, th this skill set will serve students like him pretty well as they move into the future. And you've already lit up the, uh, the question board. So a question has come in about whether um, you're finding that um, students with learning differences are also being um, affected by, by the situation and, and, and sort of what, what are their circumstances? Yes, they definitely are being affected. Uh, I, I think one of the, the greatest stories I heard from a school district, it was about how they um, are setting up learning. We heard about the learning pods that were happening organically between homes. Uh, and uh, sometimes that was even creating an inequity. But now we're hearing about school districts that are setting up opportunities where families with students who have been identified as having learning disabilities, um, they're able to come in and, and work directly with educators. And that's been helpful, but it has been a challenge. Talk about a, a pandemic hack. I mean, the, the creation of learning pods is, is such an interesting innovation. And it's, and it's nice to see, as you've mentioned, that uh, uh, school districts are now handling this rather than sort of affluent parents doing it uh, alone uh, Absolutely. for their own kids. Yeah. Um, so now we get to hear from uh, Dr. Colleen Kraft, who's a professor of pediatrics at the Keck School of Medicine at the University of Southern California and Children's Hospital in Los Angeles. Through her work as the president of the American Academy of Pediatrics in 2018, Dr. Kraft is known for her advocacy to optimize the health of all children through technology and innovation. And I know she's been a, a participant in the children's and screens community for a long time. Colleen, take it away. Thank you so much. Um, great to have the opportunity to, to present here. And I'm gonna talk a little bit about health and, and, and very interesting, a lot of the same issues that we see with, with education we're actually seeing on health and much of it is very much related here. So I'm gonna go through three basic patients and scenarios that we tend to see. Um, Alex is a young teenager who has ADHD and anxiety disorder. And throughout 
time before the pandemic, he always worried about the consequences for his poor grades and poor behavior at school. He was always the class clown at school. And, and when he wasn't being the class clown, he worried about was what his friends thought about him. Well, what happened to Alex during the pandemic and the divide is that he actually thrived in virtual school because he could do this. He could attend his classes and focus on his work without having to draw attention to himself. And then he could have virtual meetings with his friends. He was able to reach out to his teachers. He was able to reach out to his counselor. And then he had his time with his friends. And, and Alex is actually many of my patients. So I have had lots of patients who do have learning differences, some of whom have really thrived. What's been interesting from my own perspective is that I could not tell you who would thrive and who wouldn't, but a number of my kids really have. So supporting teens like Alex, you know, we're gonna want to continue options of virtual classes, offer school-based behavioral health services virtually as well too, and really focus with these kids on cognitive recognition. You know, you're, you're doing really well. What is it that's helping you do well? And what is the insight that you gain that can be applied to some of your other situations when you are in person, in class, or with friends, or with family? And then taking the time and the ability, because of that, that virtual connection, to partner with the teams to make small changes. Some in-person classes and activities would still help socialization, even for the kids who've thrived online. So choir, band, theater, art, photography, sports, wherever that child has some interest, they can practice some of the skills that you build through their insight and working with them virtually into an in-person type of arena. And again, this is something that we're learning and it is very much a silver lining of the pandemic and of going onto, onto things virtually that could help a lot of our kids. So my second one is Keisha. Keisha is a good student. She has lots of friends at school. She has several close friends and she's very involved in basketball and in band. But she had a very different experience during, during COVID-19. She attends online school. Her grandmother was hospitalized with COVID-19 for three weeks, and she really couldn't focus on her, her schoolwork at that time. Her grades were dropping, and her mental health problems manifested as having episodes of chest pain. She went to the emergency department twice. She's had difficulty sleeping and, and she really hasn't wanted to virtually meet with her friends because she's feeling bad about herself. One of the things that, that often happens with many of my kids like Keisha as well too, is that being at home and not having that physical outlet like basketball has led to weight gain. And so they feel self-conscious. They don't wanna be around with other friends as well too. This is again, where that the, the, the divide is more than just broadband access and computer access. It is digital, but it's also social. It's where kids don't do well digitally socializing with other kids. So how do we support a kid like Keisha? It, it's essentially recognizing her losses during this time, her family member illness, her separation from friends, and her loss of efficacy at school. What can be done? And again, her, her advantage is that she does have adequate broadband to do some cognitive training via uh, broadband initially and now in person as soon as possible. So to ask her things like, what can you do to connect with your grandmother? What can you do to have fun with a friend? And then resetting those school expectations and addressing perfectionism which is a big thing in many of our kids with a digital divide. The divide, again, isn't always the devices. It is how you perceive information, how you take in and learn information, and how that affects your overall mental health, which is health. And again, virtual counseling can help, but maximizing those safe in-person activities is really important for kids like Keisha. And then my little girls, Genesis and Grace, they are good students. They're in fourth and fifth grade. They live in a two bedroom apartment with their parents, aunt and uncle, very close knit family. And one of the things that they have received at school have been breakfast and lunch. And this is many, many of my kids. And sadly, these are the kids who really fell behind in COVID-19 and the health effect is very much with what happened to their family. We've, when we've talked about kids and health and COVID-19, what 
people have said is that kids don't get as sick with COVID-19. And that is true. Some kids get very sick with it, but most of them have mild illness. But what's happened is many of them have lost family members from COVID-19. Uh, I recall one evening in clinic where I had four children in a row who had lost a parent to COVID-19. And we don't think about this when we think about the divide and health effects, but for these little girls, their father died of COVID-19 and their uncle died. These are people in their thirties and forties. Their mother and aunt became ill, but now they're the breadwinners, they're out doing domestic work. And a lot of these kids are being left alone with their Zoom school, with their virtual learning, without adequate broadband, without adequate access to computers. And that their way to, to get education and healthcare and counseling really is something that is impacted by the digital divide. What we learn is that the digital divide becomes even more divisive when you throw in poverty and when you throw in illness. And so what we know about the digital divide in health is this, is that it affects our most underserved children and families. And it is somewhat because of the access to broadband and equipment, but it's more because of what's been affected in the adults who are caring in the lives of these kids. That there's been more death and disability and more loss for these children. And there's the loss of school as that safe place for learning and for food and for socializing. Children are home at, at much younger age doing, due to parental death and disability and need for work. And we are seeing this a great deal. We're seeing 10 year olds who are taking care of their seven year old and three year old siblings at home because their parents don't have an option. If they can get funding, if they can get money from doing any type of work, they'll go out and do it. Food insecurity and inequity in educational resources is, is really paramount. At the same time, we often see both overnutrition and undernutrition with these kids. So obesity has actually, or rates of obesity have skyrocketed. And that we've had increasing reports of accidents at home. There are increasing reports of both child abuse and domestic violence. So how do we support these kids? Policies to support struggling families is going to be really important. And as we are looking at opening up schools, again, using school as that hub for food, for broadband internet access. Some of our schools are giving out the Wi-Fi hotspots. I think a better solution would be a partnership with a Verizon or a Spectrum or some of these companies that you think about who's done well during the pandemic, think about the broadband companies. Could they not partner with a school to help them out and help, help out these kids who go to that school? Rotating on-site as much as possible. And one innovative uh, recommendation that I've seen some schools do is actually hire the parents for childcare at school, for activities, for art and music and physical education, for cooking. If they are going to be providing food and food home in a backpack, hire a parent to do some of that work. They can be on site there when their children are rotating in in that area. And uh, stop sharing here. But I think that the important part is that the digital divide has just really augmented the divide that we see in health with all of our kids. And, and having access to a caring adult in their life, having access to equity in terms of broadband and equipment, and really recognizing the tremendous loss that these kids have, have received in their families first and foremost, but in their education, is really gonna be part of how we strategize how to do better as things come back into play. Thank you so much. Uh, it, it occurs to me hearing you talk that you're really dealing with two big systems here, the healthcare system, as well as the education system. And, and many of the people uh, watching this program are advocates or facing situations where they know there are pockets of resistance in their, in their local school systems and in the, tel in, the, in the health community where telehealth isn't necessarily underwritten by insurance and things like that. Uh, one of our questioners points out that children themselves now uh, have a really interesting, important uh, political profile. They, are, they wanna be advocates, they are really engaged with a variety of issues. And the questioner wonders whether the students themselves can be marshaled 
to maybe address some of the recommendations that you just listed? I think certainly older students could be. Um, I, I, I think that, you know, that the Nicole's um, presentation and showing the voice of that student is so powerful. And to be able to have our students speak out to what it is that they need, um, because the assumption may be, well, we just need better broadband or more equipment, but it may not be that. It may be that we need sports and we need to be able to do our sports. We may need be to be able to do um, our band and other activities. Things that are social that are social activities where we can have face-to-face -face interaction with our peers is going to be important. Or it could be a peer come, it could be a, a team coming out and saying, there were some really good things about this virtual platform that worked for me and helped me out with my learning disability. Could we continue to do part of my education this way? But I think that that the voice of, of, of children is important. Wonderful. Thank you. Um, and now it's my pleasure to turn to Dr. Beth Holland, who is a partner at the Learning Accelerator, where she leads their research and measurement work, as well as digital equity advisor for the Consortium of School Networking. She has over 20 years of education experience in various teaching, administration, and research capacities, so brings to this subject a real applied sensibility. Beth, over to you. Great, thank you so much, Lee. It's, it's really a pleasure to be here and to work with everybody and to bring the school side of this into the conversation because I think the you know schools have really gone through a Herculean effort in the past several months really trying to, to address this issue of the digital divide. And in thinking about how to best frame everything today, knowing that honestly, Lee, I rely on your data way too often, um, I decided to take more of a historical perspective. Um, because I think one thing that has been, I won't call it a silver lining, but maybe a tin lining, is that this current pandemic shined a light on a problem that we've been talking about for years. And so thinking through this, in 1996, Larry Irving, who at the time was the head of the Commerce Department's National Telecommunications Infrastructure Administration, first coined this idea of a digital divide and said, you know, there's a definite discrepancy between who does and does not have access and what are we going to do about it? This has long-term ramifications. And his coining of that phrase also should be noted that it comes at the end of decades of conversation between various communities about who did and did not have access to the technology being developed. Um, Dr. Charlton McElwin at NYU talks about what he called the black vanguard as well saying that there's so much of technology that's not just about access, but who's being given the access and who's being represented by it when we think about it by race. And so along the lines of, you know, Larry's coining of this term of the digital divide, there was also the very, very first national education technology plan that came out that year. And it was the first time that official documentation from the Department of Education said, schools need to support this process and start to look at how are we going to get our schools connected? And, you know, 96 was a very busy year. At the same time, um, the FCC, the Federal Communications Commission, instituted the E-rate program. And this is a program that was specifically intended to offset the cost of getting internet access directly to schools and libraries. Now, What's frankly kind of amazing is there wasn't, even though there were a lot of researchers and a lot of people documenting the problems of the digital divide, the challenges of which students were having not just access to technology, but as Nicole said, really meaningful learning opportunities with technology. We got all the way to 2016 before it came back again in a national education technology plan. And at that time, they started talking about the digital use divide meaning that some students have, are, have access to the technology, but solely use it for remediation, test prep, basic content consumption, you know, very passive experiences, while other students were having these really rich, meaningful opportunities to connect with experts in the field, to you know, construct their own understanding of complex ideas, uh, to start building and coding and developing. And they also raised a point where technology should be used to create conditions for universal design for learning, meaning every student can actually access the learning experience. 
And there was a question earlier and Colleen touched on it some about students with different learning differences. And when a universal approach is taken, the technology can provide really meaningful scaffolds and supports to help all students be able to learn, whether that's closed captioning or text to speech or dictation, changing fonts and colors, lots of options. Um, so in 2016, things started rolling again. And in 2017, um, current acting FCC chair, um, Jessica Rosenworcel made a comment of the homework gap is the cruelest part of the digital divide. And she really started seeing that there was this major discrepancy between those students who had access at home and those didn't. And in 2019, uh, where I've been working at COSIN, there was an infrastructure report. And in the infrastructure report, 92% of our technology leaders who were surveyed said that their schools could meet the minimum bandwidth requirements as defined by the FCC to ensure that their students had internet access. But only 10% knew that all of their students had access at home. And so if we come back to last spring, um, Common Sense Media did a survey to find out, well, what is the real extent of the digital divide? And they found that approximately 30% of public school students have no access to the internet or devices to sustain effective um, distance learning. And so when we start to think about that and break it down, you know, approximately, you know, a quarter of students, even in high connected areas, still lack adequate internet access. And that goes to half when we start talking about maybe rural communities or places with affordability challenges. Um, and critical in that, we have to remember that there's 400,000 teachers who can't teach because of lack of internet access. And so these numbers I think were really astounding and got a lot of attention. And so Common Sense and the um, Common Sense, the Southern Education Foundation and Boston Consulting Group put another report out this fall. And they found that with all of the efforts made by teachers and schools and administrators, they have closed about 20 to 40% of that digital divide, but they really identified that it came down to three things, affordability, accessibility, and adoption. And I know that Angela is going to talk a lot about the affordability and accessibility component, but I want to address the adoption piece where 40% of disconnected students could have access, could potentially afford it, but they don't necessarily know how to get that access. And that could be because of English language challenges. It could be because of um, undocumented status. It could be because of housing insecurity. And so I think this is really where schools have stepped in with solutions. Um, there's a lot of different ways that they've thought about doing this. Um, community hotspots, so creating Wi-Fi access in parking lots, fields, patios, um, we're partnering with local businesses and libraries to say, okay, you can go to this safe space and get access. Not ideal in a pandemic, but it is an option. There is low cost broadband for most of the major service providers, AT&T, Comcast, Cox. Typically schools are finding that is not sufficient to support distance learning. Like it doesn't allow for the Zoom meetings like what we're experiencing right now. Districts across the country right now in response are starting to build their own networks. And this comes a little to Colleen's comment about, well, what about the major providers? And the major providers are still sort of looking for their profit margins. And so it's really come down to how the schools are building their own networks. And then that last piece has been talked about a lot is this idea of mobile hotspots, the putting hotspots on buses, giving kids hotspots to go home, and how that's been able to create essentially a Band-Aid to this problem. Um, I know that Antoine's going to talk more about policy, but I feel like we have some good news coming in right now where there is a lot of money that the federal government through the American Rescue Plan is using to specifically address the digital divide. But I want to touch on this concept that equal access does not mean equitable access. And Nicole brought this up and Angela brought this up that we really need to think about when we talk equity, that we're thinking about the narratives, the conditions and the opportunities that really support and benefit all of our learners. Um, a technology director in Illinois, Oyen Idowu made a great point. She said, one-to-one -one doesn't mean that we're done with digital equity. And so to leave you with sort of this broader idea, 
at the Learning Accelerator and with COSEN, we've been really talking about how do we look not just at these digital foundations, but also those essential supports for learning and then the opportunities that exist from it. And so I would say we, we definitely need to broaden that idea. Um, and Lee, I will turn this over to you. Great. Um, we're going to um, uh, give you a question right away from one of the uh, participants in the, in, the, in the Zoom meeting, Lee Davenport. Uh, we'll, we'll be asking the, the question um, Great. In, a, in a moment. Hi, guys. Uh, my name is Lee Davenport. I'm with US Ignite. Can you hear me? Mm -hmm. Oh, good. So again, thank you, Lee, other Lee, for introductions. Um, I work at a research nonprofit. We're about to spend um, about $2.7 million of the NSF's dollars, the National Science Foundation's dollars, to really understand how we can increase access to students, um, to populations that are currently underserved, underserved. We're going to spend a fair amount of time working with faculty locally across these pilots uh, to understand in what ways the introduction of internet access um, can have positive social impacts. And so maybe you could give me some pointers on where we can start in, in, to you and to your work. What ways has the introduction of internet access been studied to show positive impact student success during COVID, during the pandemic, um, and maybe if not during the pandemic and, and before that? So I can, that's an excellent question and two pieces. So the first one is Dr. Johannes Bauer at Michigan State University at the Coelho Center put out a report um, right before the pandemic actually started. And his group did a study of students in rural Michigan. And one of the things that's amazing they found is when they controlled for race, they controlled for gender, socioeconomics, they found a direct correlation between high-speed internet access and education attainment. And they defined education attainment as grade point average, SAT score, and desire to attend higher education. And what they really attributed it to was if students had this continuous access to high-speed internet, they were curious. Like they wanted to learn more. If they had a question, they went and explored it. It wasn't just, oh my gosh, I have to do this one assignment and a very laser focus. Um, on the more of a during COVID, and I can put the link somewhere. Um, I did a small study with a district in rural California last spring. It's a 98% Hispanic Latino community. It's mostly, it's almost 100% considered below poverty. It's a district that had invested in community Wi Fi, invested in one to one programs. Technology was not the issue. And yet, still, some of the challenges that they found going into remote learning was students still really struggled to be self directed. They were desperate to still have those social connections and they were so happy that the district placed a focus with their teachers on how do we cultivate community? How do we make sure that we're building in social supports for our students? And it was very active professional learning on the part of the district to work with the teachers. So what's the social emotional learning component? How do we make sure our students know how to monitor their own progress? How do they know how to reach out for help? And so, you know, again, that's a very, very tiny little study that was done on, you know, teacher perceptions of the student experience, but I can at least point you um, to that data. But the Coelho Center one, I think, is one of the best ones that come, has come out recently on that topic. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Beth. We're going to turn back now to Angela Seifer, um, the Executive Director of the National Digital Inclusion Alliance, uh, to talk a little bit about now federal policies that support bridging the digital divide. So back to you, Angela. Thanks, Lee. So Beth was telling us um, the some of the policies that the federal government is now getting into around the digital divide, particularly the affordability question. So previous to the pandemic, the federal government was really only addressing the digital divide in terms of the availability of the infrastructure. And so now, I think, big hallelujah from lots of folks that the recognition that affordability is a problem and that they are addressing it through um, the emergency broadband benefit and the um, emergency connectivity fund, both of which Beth mentioned in her slides. What we're not yet seeing from the federal government is addressing, um, so the devices kind of get mixed into that. Let me note that like often it is connectivity and devices. <laughs> so then you have to cover both of them with one pot of money. So it's not, the devices part just kind of gets thrown in. But then the part that totally gets skipped is that digital navigation, tech support, uh, digital literacy kind of guidance. 
a really important note um, for anyone who's in this work is that, uh, as I, I like to say, kids don't live alone. So it kind of drives me totally bonkers when we focus all of our efforts on just the students. Because those we all know the data is super clear that the more engaged the parents are with the students education, you know, the, the increased uh, impact on that students education when the parents are engaged, that the pay if the parents don't have access to the internet and the digital skills to use it and the device, then they're probably not talking to the school, particularly right now right interaction with the school is very digital. Um, so being able to address the whole needs of the family is essential and that digital literacy part is where can the parent help the student, right? When the technology isn't working, when something, when the application just isn't coming up, right? When they lose their password, right? That, that there's a structure, a, a way to support the students in that way. Um, when um, there was a mention earlier by Colleen about internet service providers and, and Beth mentioned it also, that yes, they can be part of the solution. Um, and as Beth also mentioned, do not expect that they're just gonna hand over some, some solutions to get at this. Uh, in the internet, in the United States, internet service is a commodity, right? We pay for it. It is not a utility. It's very lightly regulated. The internet service providers, their end goal is profit. And that's not, I'm not judging them. That's just a fact, right? So we all need to work within the realities of today which is that that's how it works. So if you want to look for solutions around internet service provision, it is partnering with them, but you're gonna pay for it. Or as Beth noted, maybe you wanna create your own solutions. A quick note on hotspots. Hotspots are often the solution we go to. They are, as Beth said, a Band-Aid. The wireline solutions that are more reliable, uh, that are faster, that are less likely to drop service, in the end, that's where we want to get everybody to is that reliable service. And in the short term, yes, hotspots, but those are not for the long term. So Angela, it occurs to me that even with this, this the new benefits that, uh, that we're talking about through the, through the Biden stimulus plan, the policy environment um, in and around the, the kinds of uh, families that we're talking about is you know full of important issues. Uh, the, the general nature of high quality education, um, adequate medical care and insurance, um, uh, good housing issues. So I'm wondering, as you watch the politics of this unfold and the policy environment unfold, how how effective do you think um, digital divide advocates are in, in sort of treating the broad, you know, the access issues and the funding issues in a broader context of families that are in need of a, of a bunch of different kinds of help. I think we've definitely missed that piece that it's not just the device and the connectivity, but it's also that digital literacy tech support. I think that's the biggest part that we haven't been able to get at. And that's not because folks don't care, lots of folks care, right? The local response by school districts and other community-based organizations has been just phenomenal, right? Going out there and figuring out how to get connectivity into homes has been incredible. And I think it's just a learning piece to learn like, oh, we have also got to address this digital literacy situation or that guidance to, to help folks. Thanks so much. And there's a, I guess there's another question now coming from a, another panelist who we'll, we'll be able to um, bring onto the screen to, to ask the question, Dr. Ed C. Thank you so much for this very important work. Um, I was wondering what policies would you say would most help the low income uh, learners who don't have access to uh, broadband internet? What would help them the most? Uh, would it be like getting, say, a Wi-Fi hotspot, or would it be like having print media? Is there particular policies that you think would would work best for those uh, learners? Yeah, that's that's a great question. In situations where the infrastructure is not physically available, that's when we need the creative kind of solutions, where it's the Wi-Fi on buses or it's print, right? Because getting them a hotspot isn't going to work if there's really nothing there to connect to. But in areas urban and rural and suburban where the infrastructure exists, we all as a society have to say those students having less is not okay, right? Just because they live somewhere where they can't afford it doesn't mean that it's okay to give them less of an education than we, than we are providing to everyone else. That's a great question. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Angela. 
Now it's a real pleasure to uh, introduce you to Antoine Wallace, who's a researcher by training and a social justice advocate by choice. He's the managing director for the National Innovation Service, where he provides thought leadership in evaluation research design to appreciate and understand latent data and emerging trends in order to scale equitable solutions. Antoine, your turn now. Good afternoon, everyone. I couldn't be more pleased by this conversation for um, having, in the arc of this conversation, heard the arc of the work over the last 20 years. Um, many of the things that I'll cover today actually were well covered by people in this uh, call, um, which was not always the case. And so the, the social justice advocate in me um, says that there is direct action and movement um, in various parts and uh, in, in multiple places across this organization, across the United States. Um, and I wanna talk a little bit about the intersection of that uh, as it relates to empirical data. And so um, the agenda was to you know, run through these definitions I think that have been well uh, talked about in terms of digital divide, digital inclusion and digital excellence. I think our ability to align around working definitions of this uh, be become very important. I'll talk a little bit about the techno-social measurements of safety and thriving and exactly what that is, and the phenomenological approach that we took to COVID and to racial dis uh, disproportionality and what that has meant for what we call digital plurality. So we talked about the access and you know these very uh, basic conversations of digital divide that have evolved over time. The digital excellence piece has been where are the, and we've talked about it in terms of sentiment, but we haven't really talked about it in terms of what have been some of the operating, operating things for um, guidelines and metrics for private industry. Uh, we've talked about you know, the generosity of, of firms who provide broadband um, connectivity, but what might be some of the federal metrics uh, for interstate commerce um, in terms of providing this ubiquitous broadband service? Uh, digital inclusion has been well talked about in this call. I, I just want to bubble down on the affordability question and also on the veritable question of broadband speed, right, um, in place. And I think this question about digital literacy is absolutely right. I think the question is, is there ubiquitous access, not just access, I think we have to put qualifiers on what, the, what that access actually means for digital literacy and training. And I'll talk a little bit about what we found. And I think we have to qualify what te technical support looks like, right? I think there's variability across the country, depending on where you live. And I think high quality standards across this is a good place. Uh, if anybody from NIST is on the call, uh, it's a good place to think about what standards might be um, and applications and online content. Um, and then this question of digital equity, I think has evolved out. Of how can all of the people have all of the things that they, that they need? And I think this is, operating inside of the way that we think about the provision of public goods, even by private actors. Um, and so what is the opportunity here today? I think inside of this call, I think is for, for where NIS comes in, which is the National Innovation Service, we began talking about um, safety and thriving metrics. And what we, what we meant when we said safety and thriving were, were questions about how to end the digital divide and, and think about digital inclusion rooted in equity these questions came out about in response to at home empirical data on broadband because many of our service providers in COVID were people who were homeless and experiencing homelessness and or had um, lived experience with homelessness. And so safety was like, what did people need from their public systems in order to feel safe? This was data collection that we've done across the, the uh, country and various cities, um, particularly working in uh, municipal governments, working within the Office of Neighborhood Safety in order to create community metrics about broadband um, in order to address the digital divide and, and actually instantiate those inside of questions of public safety. And also this question of thriving. We ask, we're asking people, what do they need to thrive inside of an economy? Um, when they feel safe. And some of these questions that we'll talk about today, people are naming broadband 
And I wanna drill down inside of the questions that we were talking about. The animating question for the work was like, how might we strengthen parental efficacy and promoting protective factors for children? And the questions, and this is the, 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 uh, the lit that we used, the, question, the reason that we came up with those measures were we were thinking about this conversation and the arc of the conversation as we do systems work, right? Where do you ignore people and they're marginalized towards like what does empowerment actually look for? It's when people are actually defining those terms for themselves. And this is the, the intersection of vulnerability. And so people who were experiencing homelessness, we were doing research in communities with people who were um, with young folks, youth and young adults who were experiencing um, homelessness and family units that were experiencing homelessness who were not able to um, get broadband access inside of shelters. And so the, the way that this began to think about what these techno-social measurements were, like what would happen if we started to really, inside of our public institutions and service provisions, instantiate these type of metrics where we actually defer to people's needs inside of understanding this question about digital divide. And in very particular, this conversation is about our process overview. So we begin this phase one of digital equity roadmap. We actually begin to identify this problem among homelessness uh, populations, people experiencing homelessness. But we saw this as much broader issue as we were thinking about children who were arriving in shelter, right? School and distance learning, where there was no, they had a computer, they had a, they may have even had a router, but in uh, while experiencing homelessness in shelter, did not have a place where they could actually be engaged in the in the school day. And what we know about this question that we have about in local parentis as we think about schools, is that the opportunity then and the onus was then pushed back to onto parents. And the question that began to bubble up out of the lived experience was, what was the parental efficacy to be able to approach uh, parents to be able to help their kids in order to address this thing that they didn't even know was a question around this homework, this homework gap. Through a series of uh, interviews and workshops, we began to, across the country, about seven cities, to think through like what were some of the actions that people would needed in order to move through this work. Where we currently are is starting to work on this early phase of this work around drafting this roadmap um, to really appreciate what are some of the service cliffs inside of public institutions where, where we don't necessarily think about broadband connectivity or this ubiquity question. Um, and yet we have this obligation, um, both in with now elective uh, return to school in some places and mandatory stay at home for, for others. And what are the applications when people are homeless and don't have homes? We've interviewed about 50 people, uh, systems leaders across the country, 620 participants from community-wide discovery workshops. Uh, we've done a systems audit of uh, policies and processes that we've looked at. We've engaged parental uh, advisory committees to really understand people who have lived experience, both with homelessness and also with digital divide as parents who are trying to address some of these issues, all for the purpose of a single vision of what a digital inclusion system transformation might be rooted in equity. We are now in the analytical process, bringing together all of those transcripts. Um, and what, that, what we have honed in on is, is a part of our uh, participatory action research for empirical data, which is the parental efficacy self-report um, as, as compared to the homework gap, which is this uh, artifact of the digital divide as we understand it. And what might be some of the other data in public policy that we might need to, to be able to really appreciate what the gaps are in current data? And then where are the opportunities uh, to create what we call meso level data? I too am often, uh, like many people, uh, relying on Lee's data, great data at Pew, but sometimes that data isn't as granular as we would need it in some of the communities that we work in, in terms of some of the other systems that we are finding people, such as ACS, Child Protective Services, um, in terms of youth homelessness, particularly when we're talking about um, neighborhood safety and questions of um, of, of school attendance um, and FTEs as it relates to some of the uh, racial 
uh, gap related to uh, school funding. These are some of the very important questions that we would like to bring community data to in order to address some of these outcomes. So what are we looking at? We're looking at techno-social measurements um, of connectivity, speed, access, device. Um, the demographics that we have looked at is household income and earnings. I was very um, pleased to hear about uh, the study that where, where we were controlling for those things and looking now specifically at broadband speeds as an independent variable to explain some of these some of the uh, outcomes for uh, students. I'd be very interested in what that looks like at the early childhood level and particularly like what are the opportunities to do that inside of um, Head Start, um, particularly what we know about first five years and early learners um, zero to three. Um, the current state, right, is that this is all over the place. We are gathering ourselves to really address this issue. Um, I think the current legislation goes a bit far, but I think when we start to think about all of the additive issues in the intersections, it's not a well orchestrated stuff. And so one of the things that I think we want to think about is what is the coordination, the accountability, and the community driven processes to be able to have protective factors for children and families. And I think one of the, the last part, uh oh, I know I'm almost at time. One of the last part is like, how might we work together? And what should teaming and collaboration look like across this work? And what are some of the new practices and structures that need to come out as, a, as we think about this work? Well, the big old smile you see on my face is listening to a researcher talk about research design is like catnip <laughs> for me. So that, that was wonderful. Uh, you, you actually were sort of flicking at it in your in your final comments. If, could you put on your futurist hat a little bit and talk a, a little bit about what happens after the COVID money is um, is spent and and we're in an, in the next era? I think I think that's a, a a great question because I think what we've seen in both in terms of federal dollars for uh, ESG dollars and CSBG dollars and all of these are planning dollars for various agencies to address. Uh, either housing, homelessness, um, uh, Head Start, some of these other programs, is that we don't have explicit requirements inside of those planning dollars to think through this question of digital inclusion, of digital literacy and digital equity. And because it's not an agenda setting item for a lot of people who have many other urgent priorities, it's one of the things that I think is going to fall to the back burner. And that's what, that's my fear. I think what the opportunity is inside of that is to really think um, more prospectively inside of OMB, right, with these new measure, measures that they have around racial disproportionality and racial equity to really center these questions about uh, broadband connectivity um, and digital literacy as one of the components of thinking about that architecture across agencies. Now reach the uh, Q and A, uh, general Q and A uh, part of the of the program. And I, there was a, a, a sort of uh, technical question that came from the, the crowd about the, the specifically the two point seven billion dollars that is part of the broader stimulus effort on broadband. Can someone speak to? sort of um, what is where is that going and what it, what it's going to do? There's a lot of money out there. I'm not sure where the 2.7 billion came from. Okay. There's 7.17 billion for um, for the emergency brought emergency connectivity fund, which is the idea that um, there's money for schools and libraries. There will be some money. For, it's not quite functioning yet, but there will be money for schools and libraries to request for them to cover the cost of the internet access. And this is likely to end up use, being used for those sponsored agreements or single payer agreements where the school and now more so the library has gone out and said, okay, we're gonna buy um, you know, 500 accounts of this broadband service and then they help get it into those homes. Um, then there's also the 3.2 billion for the emergency broadband benefit. And I think the piece I meant to mention that, that I missed was that there's also $350 billion, the amount of money folks, it's just kind of, my head just spins with all of it. Uh, $350 billion for local and state governments to do whatever it is they need to do with the pandemic. And we know that this is one of the big issues that has hit us during the pandemic. So 
the idea that local and state governments could use some of that money to address any of the barriers that we've discussed, that's all very real. And that's where um, for advocates to discuss that with their elected officials, because you know when there's that much money involved, the elected officials were going to want to be involved in how that money is spent. So I would talk to your elected officials about how that money is going to be spent and encourage them to use it for the addressing the affordability, right? Paying for somebody's internet making sure the whole family has devices, not just the students, because how are parents going to apply for jobs or get a vaccine or anything without a computer these days? And then that digital literacy support, who's answering questions? Uh, Nicole, you, you really um, hit on a note that, that uh, was so striking about 2020. It was not just about the pandemic, but there were, there were the racial justice protests. There was an election that was um, crazy. And I, I, I wanted to invite you to talk more about the, the things that you were talking about, how this conversation fits into the broader conversation about what's going on in the culture uh, and, and maybe sort of helps address some of the things that are going on in the culture. Yeah, certainly. You know, uh, I think, you know, some people have named it as we're, we're experiencing more than one pandemic during this time period. And um, we are, are dealing with a lot right now. We're also seeing how our students are using uh, social media and using uh, digital technologies in a very different way to communicate with each other outside of our traditional learning um, landscape. And in a recent study done with our California Council on Teacher Education, we talked with some teachers about what their concerns were going to be moving forward and where we heard a lot initially about learning loss we're hearing more that it's about um, the social supports right social isolation was a concern but our students are uh, actually when, when we did talk to Kamau about hit the concern socially the the response was well no you know I'm still connecting with other students that's not the concern of mine so it's it's really about um, yes, we have to address these larger issues and finding different ways to hear from our families and hear from our students. And then how can we um, give attention to our current crises and how to support? I think Colleen hit on this too in talking about how our students are experiencing losses at home. Well, in addition to experiencing direct loss in their families, whether it's a parent or an aunt or an uncle who may die of COVID, they're seeing other things in the media and they're seeing other losses that are happening, um, people being murdered, and the injustices. And so I think that's impacting our students as well. And so that is a form of technology that they have access to. And I'm not suggesting that we turn off the screen, but we need to think about other ways to engage in conversations and um, how do we find out the supports once we do know what the supports are that are needed for our families we need to go further than just figuring out what they are and we need to actually put in put in some action plans to better engage and support our families if we're saying the data say engaging families is important then let's let's actually do that right nice nice um let's go back um to to maybe even pre-internet days there's a smart question here about um the capacity to use ubiquitous technologies like the television to uh, address some of these issues. It's been, it's been largely an internet related conversation, but I wonder if other, if you, you have ideas about how other media can be marshaled in sort of new and better ways to address some of the things that we talked about. It's sort of open-ended question. Who, does anyone want to tackle that? Yeah. Leak. I'd like to jump in. I actually, I think it's a great point about television. And in fact, when the pandemic hit last March, there was a group of us in a meeting with the Department of Ed. Um, I happened to have done my postdoc work as part of working on a project through the Department of Ed's Ready to Learn program, which is what's funded things like um, PBS Kids and the Center for Public Broadcasting. You know, Sesame Street was initially funded as part of a Ready to Learn program. Um, we were working on the cat in the hat knows a lot about that as a way of introducing science and engineering principles to preschool kids. And so there are opportunities to think about how do we leverage public television or public radio as a way of reaching kids that may not be connected. The challenge of it and um, Larry Cuban, who's a historian and a professor emeritus at Stanford, actually did a great article about how during the Spanish flu, they were trying to use radio to get content to kids when schools were shut down. I think the challenge of that is it's one way. It's a, the students are passive consumption. 
and the media is pushing out the technology. And so it's almost what like Paolo Freire would call like the banking model of education. Like I put it out, I deposit it into your brain where the internet becomes so powerful is it's created the opportunity for that two-way engagement. You know, the students can be more active learners. And so while yes, programs like Ready to Learn are amazing at getting opportunities pushed out into communities and getting content out there, we have to remember that so much of learning happens through interaction, through communication, through social learning, and through really meeting students where they are um, in terms of meeting their needs. So yes, it's a wonderful mechanism. And we need to think about how we really create these rich, meaningful learning environments that support our kids. Lee, can I add the, the equity lens on what Beth just said? If, it, if, if, if I feel like my child should have that two-way learning, why is it okay for a poor child to not have that two-way learning? And, and I think also, right, and even as we think about PBS, right, and we think about the content of PBS and, and, the, and inside of the racial disproportionality that we see, we need direct content that speaks directly to people who are most marginalized, right? And so there is a cultural artifact that needs to be generative inside of the community that is disproportionately left outside of that conversation. And I think the innovation is possible inside of asking those communities what needs are currently unmet inside of this portfolio of both digital and analog media, right? And, and we might see generative solutions that bubble up out in from those communities. I'd also like to add to that, even in our use of the digital tools in classrooms and how um, I, I've, I speak of this often, how some students are able to design themselves in characters and other students are not because they can't see themselves through the tools that are being used or there might not be a young, uh, the ability to, to create a character that has an Afro and has um, a, a browner, you know, deeper toned skin complexion. And so sometimes students disengage from those tools, not just because they're not exciting, but also because they can't see themselves through those tools that are being used. Colleen, um, you know, you, you have the panoramic view on so, on so much of this. I, I, what's the right way to think holistically about this? If, if, the, if you were gonna meet the needs of, of all families and all children, what other pieces would you add to this? I, I think I would really be working on, on the pieces. Certainly the digital divide is one thing, but I think that really working with families on what can you do together with the adults and the children in the home, with being active, with interactive activities that, that you can have with another human being inside your your home and being very mindful of that's something that becomes part of your routine every day so so for so many of my families what they found is just taking a walk outside um shooting some hoops uh reading a book things that are that that really you can do without even having to think about the digital divide is, is something that's really important and something that we we really want to remember, even if it's one thing that you do, even if it's cooking one meal together, even if it's reading one book together, if it's taking a 10 minute walk, that's something that actually helps to build those connections. It helps to build the frontal lobes in those young children, in those middle childhood kids, and even in those teenagers to continue those connections despite what your, your barriers may be with the divide. Very wise. Um, it's, maybe we can start with Antoine on this, but all, all of you might be interested in addressing it. And it's a, it's a, it's, it's too bad I even have to ask this question. Um, but, uh, but all of us um, are, have been thinking about this in an evidence-based way. And our politically polarized culture, um, how much of a problem is it that evidence doesn't seem to matter sometimes? And, and are you finding ways to be persuasive even in an environment like this so so it's an important and uh, it, your your question begs important to whom right and it and it names a power dynamic that we all live inside of right and when we're talking about race and race of disproportionality we're talking about power 
disproportionality, right? Um, and 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 to the extent that that even Colleen's question about about being able to take a walk in a community means that you actually have access to a walkable community, right? Um, and and if you have a walkable community, you probably have more access to broadband. Than you, than you would not have, right? And if you actually have a home versus being inside of these institutions. So I think um, the, the question about uh, the redistribution of power inside of these conversations are absolutely important. And what that means is, and I think Angela is to be congratulated here, is building the constituency to be able to move policy levers, right? In the home district of those elected officials is a part of the question, right? And I do think the, the last year of politi the political economy has shown us that getting people's interest and, and empower enfranchising that, right? Getting people to the polls is not a separate and disparate conversation. It is a collective question. And I think the question is how many more public goods, right? Might we be able to create out of this crisis? That is the question that continues to be animating my thinking about it, right? Not how many more priv private goods and billionaires and, and how many more public goods that, that have positive externalities might we be able to invest in? And the numbers that Angela talked about portend an opportunity to really realize that. And the distribution of those, of those goods and, and, and externalities and, and spillover effects have to be intentional to the people who have been previously left out of the conversation and the equation, and, and to, for whom the equation says less than. And we have to be explicit about that in our public policy and in our advocacy. Well, we've just got a, uh, about five more minutes or not, not even. Um, so I, there was one final question that um, I hope you all can um, be very practical uh, in, in, in addressing your final thoughts. What, what's one practical tip that the parents who and the parent advocates uh, and others on, the, on this call can uh, take away to, to, to help shore up uh, the digital divide or help buttress the arguments that are made to uh, defeat the digital divide? Uh, what, what can parents do? And what can the people on this call do? Start, let's start with Angela, who will just go in the order that we first spoke. I, I encourage the parents to understand broadband. Broadband has previously been this thing that like, oh, I don't know, it just works. Like understand it, like know how it works and encourage others in your community to know how it works because then we then have that power, right? The power had not been with us. And I think Antoine's points are really valid about, about understanding who has power. If you don't understand how something works, what do you do? You relegate power. So understand how it works, right? Understand that it is a commodity that we purchase it and know where it comes from and know what the alternatives are. Beth's description of how some school districts are creating their own solutions, that's amazing, right? They are not saying, eh, we don't have a, we don't have a solution to this. They are out there creating solutions by God. Like let's lift up those but at the same time, that doesn't work for everybody. So we don't wanna be like, this is the only answer. Sometimes there's another answer, but know what those different options are. What's the difference between cellular and a wireline? Why do you have both your mobile phone and Wi-Fi in your house? What are the, why do you pay two different bills for that? Like know why those situations are, and then that gives you the power. And then that, if you can spread that knowledge, that's gonna change the equation. Thanks so much, uh, Nicole. Uh, family engagement in the form of conversations is one of the stronger predictors of a child's success. And so even as we talk about technology, I'd say my tip would be to keep the conversations going with families, keep encouraging conversations between families and their children, and be community builders in terms of supporting how families are building community, whether it's with the use of technology or without technology. So sometimes we just have to pick up the phone again and call and check in. So those would be uh, my practical tips. Wonderful. Colleen. I would just remind parents that they are the most important person to their child in terms of their growth and their development. And despite what else is going on, 
Time with your child, 15 minutes a day to do something interactive with your child is something that will build their brain and will build their resiliency. And when all else fails, you can always read a book. You can always talk about something. You can always interact with your child. And that's a positive. Fabulous. Beth. I'm going to build on the great statements before. And I, st I think it's really critical for parents to realize that they are just as responsible for helping to teach digital literacy as the schools. And if they don't know to really think about how are we partnering with our child's school to make sure that you know, they understand how can the technology be put in the service of helping their child develop as learners, because this online learning isn't going anywhere. And so how do we make sure that they're really helping to set their kids up for success? Wonderful. And Tuan. I really would, would just take all of these things and, and turn them in, inside out. And I want to turn that parental responsibility into parental efficacy, which is which is to say that parents, no matter their their social economic status and their literacy, that that share with your child what is important to you. And then when you find those stolen moments, because I was a, was a child of working parents. When you find those st stolen moments, go to the internet and look up those questions and share with your child your interests there and then critically inquire about what your interests are. So they might be shared interests. And that is, I think, one of the protective factors inside of this crisis, which is inside of our families, inside of that, 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 that interaction between parent and child, is the opportunity to leverage whatever digital apparatus we might have to be able to create a protective factor. Beautiful. Hey, Pam, uh, what nice job. This is assembling this bunch of big brains and wise people was uh, a great idea. So I'll turn it back to you um, with all of our thanks. Thank you so much, Lee, Nicole, Colleen, Beth, Angela, and Antoine for sharing your incredible knowledge, insights, and experience, and for empowering us all to be part of positive change. And thanks to all of you, our Zoom participants, for joining us. To continue learning about this topic, please be sure to visit our website at childrenscreens.com and read our tips for parents and other resources on the topic. We'll also post a video of today's webinar on our YouTube channel, to which we encourage you to subscribe and share with your fellow parents, teachers, clinicians, researchers, and friends. For more information about Children's Screens, please follow us on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, and LinkedIn at the account shown on your screen. Our conversation addressing children's well being and digital media will continue on April 21st as we tackle the question on all of our minds, which is how do we transition out of this pandemic with respect to our digital media use at home, at school, and in our communities? Stay tuned for more information about what we hope after uh, what we hope will be a lovely uh, Easter, happy Passover and beautiful start to spring. When you leave the workshop, you'll see a link to a short survey. Please click on the link and let us know what you thought of today's workshop. Thanks for joining us today. Everyone stay safe and well. <music>